Okay. Big Mike here with me. He's entertaining. Today's episode, we got Terrence Metcalf, father of superstar DK Metcalf, and uncle of TJ Metcalf. My favorite player, let's go. If you like what we're doing, hit the subscribe button. Hi, my name's Terrence Metcalf, NFL veteran. Coming on I Only Touch Greatness podcast. Looking for the most beers on tap? Great steaks, great staff. Head over to the John B. Pub. We got the best beers, steaks, chicken wings, nachos in town. Come see us at the John B. Pub. The John B. Pub, the best bar in town. Come sign up for our football pool. Say hey, St. you. The number one sports podcast in Vancouver with Ryan Hayes and Big Mike. Ryan Hayes and Big Mike. I only touch greatness podcast. Only Touch Greatness podcast with Ryan Hayes and Big Mike. We are going All right, good deal. How you doing? I'm Ryan, by the way. I'm the one that's been chatting with you. Man, pleased to meet you, brother. Pleased nice to, to meet you. I'm joined, I'm, I'm joined with my co-host, Big Mike. I see you, Mike. What's happening with you, man? How's it going? Hey, Terrence. Thank you very much uh, for taking the time for us today. We appreciate it. Man, thank you guys for having me, bro. See my backdrop? Already, man. <laughs> yeah, no. I saw that. I saw that. <laughs> yeah, I got the I got DK's autograph on the jersey on the wall, and then DK on the eleven by thirteen on the wall as well. Man, that's what's happening, bro. And I'm in the and I'm in the DK. I see it. I see it. <laughs> so, uh, where are you actually staying? Because I was trying to figure that out. We no, we're in Vegas. Oh, you're in Vegas. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Is that where you call home now, it is, it? It is, it is. We still got our place in Mississippi, but, you know, we had family out here that needed family around them, so we were able to pick up and, and keep our place there and move here, so it was, all, it was good. Okay. Yeah, been good. Plus, it's closer to Seattle. Yeah, exactly. With you. And then for us, yeah, for me, anyways, uh, it's only a two-hour drive from Vancouver, Canada, so... Oh really? Yeah, we. My friends all. My friends have season tickets, so I, I'm like the third person on the the Paris season tickets in the Delta Club. Uh huh. So we sit in the Delta Club seats. So we make the two hour drive down there to Seattle all the time. So y'all go to every game. Uh, my friend does, yes, but it's three of us splitting two seats. So I kind of, gotcha. I, I kind of get the last pick, but. Gotcha. But yeah, it's awesome. Well, man, since I'm meeting some people from Vancouver, man, y'all got to invite us over. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, fuck, I would love that. I don't know if you guys remember Chris Spencer when he played O-line there. Uh, we went to college together. He was a freshman my senior year. His wife is actually from Vancouver. And so they bought a place in Vancouver. He keep telling me, man, you got to go. It's beautiful. And it, you know? it is. Born in Mississippi, what was childhood like for you growing up? 
Well, kind of, it was kind of a little different now because I grew up in Miss. I grew up in Milwaukee until I was thirteen years old, and oh. so I didn't move to Mississippi until the seventh grade. So you know, kind of, kind of different. Milwaukee, Wisconsin is kind of like the concrete jungle, as they like to describe it, and uh, it was kind of a little rough. Not rough for me because my mom did a really good job of keeping us out of trouble. Uh, I really learned how to run there. <laughs> Because I didn't want to get involved in gangs. I didn't want to uh, deal with drugs like a lot of people around me was. And so, man, I, I stuck to my guns. Uh, and then my mom, my, my grandfather passed away. Uh, she decided to move back south. And so I feel like that was the best thing that she could have did for, for me and my siblings. Uh, because when we moved there, I got involved in athletics. Um, I got a different type of focus. And uh, there were other men that sold into my life that were that were that were key uh, figures that that led me down the path of uh, I like to call righteousness, man. All right. Yeah. <laughs> well, did you did you play any other sports growing up? Well, well, growing up, I was on on the track team, and a lot of people will say, "Well, track team, he must have threw the shot, the disc." But I did throw the shot put. But I was also a part of the. Uh, four by one relay team. So I did okay. a little did a little relay uh work. I was a big dude but I was kind of a fast guy in in, in little short areas. So uh and I see where DK choosing. gets it. Huh? <laughs> that must be, yeah that must be where DK gets it from. Yeah he must have gotten <laughs> it. Man God is awesome. That's all I can say. <laughs> yeah that's true. Well we got a couple questions about his run is running a little bit later here. Um Mike yeah, why did you choose to stay local and uh, attend Old Miss? Well, I, you know, I was the number one recruit out of the state of Mississippi when I was coming out back in 96. Uh, and then, um, you know, my mom at the time didn't have a car. And so it just seemed like in order for her to be involved in my collegiate career, that was the right thing to do. I had committed to Alabama at the time. Uh, but okay. when it came down to National Signing Day, I looked around the uh, – the uh, library at the school, and man, it was about 250 Ole Miss fans in there. So I had an Ole Miss scholarship and an Alabama scholarship there, and I just told my mom, turned to my mom and told her, "Hey, I'm gonna go to Ole Miss," and she she was like, "I don't care what you do, let's just get out of here from amongst all these people." <laughs> you know, that, was, that was it, man. No, no, no other reason, just so that she could be a part of uh, the experience for me as an athlete. Um, you know, she she worked while I was in high school, so she came to a few games. But when I hit college and the pros, uh, I can say she attended just about ninety percent of every game. Oh, perfect! Wow. Yeah. And then you were also a first team All American two thousand and one. Thoughts on being recognized by all your peers? Oh, that was that was that was huge. Uh, you know. Um, we prided ourselves. We had a group of guys that came in with me in 97 at Ole Miss in that class, uh, and then some outstanding athletes. You know, uh, Deuce McAllister was with me. Uh, Derek Burgess was in that class. Uh, Kedrick Vincent was in that class. Kendrick Lucas. And these are these are uh, longtime NFL guys uh, that played beyond my years in the NFL. Uh, and so we just, man, we just we just clicked really well. And lucky for me. Uh, I came in when the offensive line was struggling. And so I came in as a true freshman and I just kind of like solidified myself. You know, my, my high school coach always put that in me that you work hard. Um, you know, you, you give God glory, you, you treat your teammates, right. You treat the people right in the community and man, it, people will lift you up. And so for my peers to recognize me, man, I was doing things the right way on the football field. And in that classroom, and so I was, I was always great. We had some wonderful people, though. Great coaching staff with uh, Tommy Tuberville uh, as the head coach. But, man, his position coaches were, were outstanding. My position guy was uh, Hugh Nall. And if you ever research him, he's put about 26 guys in the NFL between Ole Miss and Auburn. And so, um, man, he's one of my, one of my um, best friends, you know, even today just wow. because of the relationship that we established uh, through the recruiting process and also through our coaching uh, experience. I mean, this guy calls me at least 
two to three times a month, and we we have a conversation. And then when he left, man, I was so lucky <laughs> because I they brought in a guy by the name of John Latina, who spent time with Clemson and Notre Dame, and then he finished up with Duke with David Cutcliffe and retired. So I got two really good offensive line coaches before I even was able to go to the NFL. Uh, I was taught the game by one, and I was taught technique and the game by another. And so that just made made things a, a very easy transition for me uh, from high school to to, uh, to to college. And then uh, take us back to uh, draft day then uh, when you were drafted third round, uh, 93rd overall in the 2002 draft. I tell you what, man, <laughs> you know, you hear all the people telling you you're great. I, my, my senior year, uh, for two years in a row, I had only given up one sack. I was the blindside protector of Eli Manning. So people were saying, man, you should. I was a consensus All-American, this and that. So I'm hearing all the hoopla. I got married the uh, summer before. I uh, we had two kids, and so everybody's saying, "Oh, you're a lock for the first round, this and that. You should be the number one tackle out of the SEC." Um, and all this noise, man, and it just it, it just came so much that when draft day came around, you know, my whole family was at the house, and they were throwing this big uh, shindig for me for the draft. I went back in my room, closed the door, so I can be in my quiet place. Uh, I got the call and then I hear the screams, um, <laughs> in the room, uh, in the living room. And so, man, draft day is always, uh, uh, an, an experience and it's tedious because it's something that, you know, you work, wait, work so hard for first off. And then that wait seems so long because back then it was the first, second and third round on the first day. So yep. I'm getting phone calls on, on on in the first round. I'm getting phone calls in the second round, but no name being called. And then finally, man, when the Chicago Bears called my name and uh, Jerry Angelo was on the other end of the phone call and said, uh, are you excited to be a Chicago Bear? And all I can say was just, yeah, man, I'm, I'm grateful and uh, ready to come in and go to work. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. yeah well, uh, if you could sit down for dinner with anyone, dead or alive, who would it be? Uh, if if I could sit down with anybody <laughs> from from a mentoring standpoint, man, it's gonna always be my grandfather, yeah. Reverend C.C. C. Metcalf. Man, that guy was an inspirer. He was born in 1911, so he had a ton of wisdom. Uh, that's the very first guy that would wake me up at uh, 6 a.m., but he would always claim it's nine o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and make me and another cousin of mine who's now he was six uh four at the time he's six eleven um played at uh arkansas state his name jeffrey williams and uh we were the two grandkids that he really like pushed the two boys that he pushed and so my grandfather man he taught me how to work hard and he was an old school guy like i said born in 1911 so he he witnessed a lot and he instilled a lot of hard work in me. And today I'm up early every morning uh, because I don't, I never want to, you know, I don't like my door to be open and I'm laying in the bed and if somebody else woke in the house and it's all, and I contribute that all to him, you know, and everything that I was teach that I could teach to Kalen and talk to him about as far as hard work and outworking the next man, it all goes back to me waking up early in the morning back then Um turning the soil over so that he can create his garden out in the country, you know? And so cleaning up the yard and making sure the smallest piece of uh, paper is off the, off the grass or, or it wasn't clean for him, you know, <laughs> I'm, just, just, I'm yeah. the same way. I'm always up super early in the morning and Mike actually is too, but was he, yeah. Yeah. And even when your day's off, you're up that early and that's yeah. kind of just morning people. I like morning people. I think, I think we're better. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, Terrence, who would you say uh, you kind of mirrored your game after? Who did you look up to when you were going through college at the and NFL level? Fair, man, I really loved Orlando Pace. Uh, okay. Orlando Pace was a dominant uh, left tackle at Ohio State. And for me, that was my first recruiting visit uh, out of high school. So I go up there by myself uh, 
get off the plane. I get picked up. They're working, uh, practicing for the uh, Rose Bowl at the time. Nobody's on campus but the team and me. And so as uh, they're preparing for the Rose Bowl, uh, <laughs> they bring me up in front of Eddie George and uh, Orlando Pace. And Orlando Pace goes, so what are you going to do, big man? And now this is a guy I've been watching my whole high school career. I really wasn't a pro guy. I didn't watch the NFL, but I watched college guys. And Orlando Pace was my guy. You know, he was up for every uh, major award in America that an offensive lineman could be up for. Um, Chris Samuels, another guy that I that I really admired that played uh, left tackle at Alabama. So now you're talking yep. about two of my favorite guys. Uh, I committed to uh, Ohio State immediately on camera. Um, you know, the first first uh, visit I go on because of Orlando Pace. Then I go on my next visit to uh, Alabama and commits there because then, bam, there go uh, Chris Samuel. Uh, he's a freshman, though, at the time. But all in all, I was like, man, I'm, I mean, I can't believe this. And so those two guys were the guys that I really, really looked up to. And then when I got in the NFL, man, John Runyon was just a big, tall, mean, nasty guy uh, when he played with the uh, Philadelphia Eagles. And yep. I loved that about him. And so, but, you know, he was uh, he was a couple of years ahead of me. <laughs> and so the rules kind of changed each year. And uh, I would see John Runyon throw guys on the ground and, and bump those guys and make sure they can't get up off the ground. So I did that. Like my rookie year, I get a 15 yard penalty. <laughs> and I'm like, that's crazy because that's what I saw this guy do. But now it's outlawed. I can't do it. And that's like one of my, you know, that's my thing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, yeah, man, that was a that was a rude awakening for me and my aggression in the, that I used in college. I had to kind of like tone that down because you couldn't do all the things that you did in college in the NFL because of personal fouls and different things like that. So, um, but yeah, man, those those two guys. Uh, if I could emulate anybody as a young player, and and then uh, John Runyon when I got into the NFL, that was one of my favorite guys. Okay. And then take me back to 2006 season and beating the Seahawks and the Saints, but then the Super Bowl to Peyton. You guys lost that one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. That was kind of tough, man. Well, we, we lost so many of our DBs uh, in the Super Bowl. And you know, with uh, Peyton Manning, Marvin Harrison, and Reggie Wayne uh, at, at the helm, you, you, you cannot go out there with rookies. Uh, facing those guys and stop them. And, and that just killed us in the second half. We ran the ball efficiently in that in the Super Bowl. Um, but our defense was was so sound. We knew offensively we had only averaged 10 and a half points that year in each game. If you go back and look at our offensive stats, we really wasn't averaging a ton of punt points. But I, but the defense would be like, hey, just get us 10 points and we're going to win this ball. <laughs> You know, I don't know if you guys remember the uh, Arizona game when that defense turned it on and they brought us back and we won that game. The offense had yep. only scored 10 points in that game, period. The defense outscored us uh, single handedly in the in the uh, last quarter of the game, last four minutes of the game. You know, we had two uh, pick sixes and that, and that sealed the deal. And so, you know, you remember the the um, the the big uh, the Bears are who we thought they were, you yeah, know, yep. and uh, the storming out of the media session. It is what it is, you know, but the defense was so phenomenal, man. Led by uh, Michael uh, – I'm sorry, uh, Brian Erlacher, uh, yep, Mike yep. Brown at the safety, Peanut Tillman uh, at the cornerback position, and across the D-line you got Alex Brown, you had uh, Tommy Harris, you had – Lance Briggs. Yeah, well, you, that's, those are the line linebackers. linebackers. Yeah. Hunter Hillenmeyer, uh, Brian Erlacher, and Lance Briggs. And then you had Ottawale Agunier. So I remember the defense so vivid, you know, with Peanut and uh, Nathan Vasher at the two corners. We lost both of them in the, in the Super Bowl in the second half and had to uh, send two rookies out there. And without them, man, it's just, it, you know, in an inexperienced backfield versus Peyton Manning, you're about to lose that. You know what I'm saying? I know. But it was such an experience, man. 
That's and what I was going to ask you. Such an experience. I was going to ask you about that experience. Uh, what was it like running out of the tunnel in the Super Bowl? Man, amazing. And then, uh, you know, the tunnel itself was amazing. But you're talking about a week of festivities leading up to just one game. They really did a really good job. And I, and they continue to do it. And I know it's bigger and better now uh, because the money is so much more grandiose. Yeah. Uh, the TV is, <laughs> I mean, they can do so much more digitally uh, in, in 2021 than, or 2020 than they could do back in uh, 2006. And so it's yep. just amazing, man, just the attention to detail and the love that they show the players. And I'm talking about you. our scout team guys felt like if they were on top of the world. You know what I'm saying? No man was left behind and from an expression standpoint when it comes to uh, just what – not just the NFL, but what Miami did, you know, uh, for for the players and, you know, just how they received everybody, not in the families and everything. Just It was just an amazing time, man. And then, uh, yeah, what was it like playing for uh, Lovey Smith? Man, Lovey, Lovey, <laughs> Lovey's an interesting guy because for for me, I, most every coach that I've ever had, uh, and, and, and and you know, it's weird to say this because it's such a such a blessing when you think about it at the end of the day. Um, Lovey doesn't curse, and okay. so when he's upset with you, it was Jiminy Christmas or. Some word <laughs> like that, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> or, geez, man, what well, you know? What were you thinking, or something like that? And so, <laughs> I had to adjust to that. And you know, he was all about business, all about business. He wanted guys that was going to work hard. Um, he wanted guys that uh, that looked good, guys that took care of their. He wanted basically men around him. You know what I'm saying? And that's how he carried himself, man. He was always clean cut. He always on game day, man, had his wife and his boys with him on the plane. Um, man, if I could say it, man, just one professional dude that I really liked uh, as a head coach. Um, and, you know, always politically, you don't always like things that because you everybody feel like, you know, like you said, I was an All-American uh, from high school through college. And then when I got to the NFL, all of a sudden got to play a backup role, which was something that I wasn't accustomed to. I don't think it had anything to do with my talents, uh, my work ethics, you know, my my timeliness or my knowledge. It was just sometimes politically things happen with you in your career mm -hmm. and you have to sit that thing and wait it out. And so, yeah, it was times I didn't like it. But uh, but as a, as a man, as a head coach, you know, I can't say anything negative about that organization, man. They, they really do a good job to me. Um, with with their players uh, over in Chicago, yeah, you spent seven seasons with the Bears. What was other than the Super Bowl your biggest highlight? You think or your favorite moment? Man, I'm gonna tell you, my always in that locker room. We had a from the time I got to Chicago um, in 2002. A lot of people look at the NFL and they think there's individuals, uh, but man, we really had a a good nucleus of guys uh, in our locker room and you you know what type of team you're going to have coming out of training camp because when we're in training camp we know we got to work hard uh, but we also knew how to take care of each other we would get together at night as in a team meeting and people are cracking jokes and really enjoying themselves and then you know you're a good team when you know the majority of everybody's wives and kids and uh in the bear like i said the bears did it's two organizations and i've only been in, in, in two to witness this uh and uh it's the the seattle seahawks and the chicago bears do a really good job with families because i was out there the Kalen's rookie year and the Seahawks had all the families there and guys with wives and kids and they're under the tent during training camp. And then afterwards you get to go out on the field and those guys, it, you sometimes, if you're a single player, you can, you can take it for granted, but I went in with the family. I went in married for three years going into my rookie year. And so having a family and having those guys take to my kids, you know, 
and my wife get to meet other players' wives and develop a bond and that she got that she has till today. You know, uh, those are the special things, and the game is gonna always be the game. And I remember wonderful times at practice, wonderful times in the games, but our camaraderie. The, the guys having dinner night at, they, at this house or guys having casino night at that house and different things like that. Those are the things that I remember uh, the most and I never take for granted. Uh, two guys I absolutely loved playing that were teammates of yours uh, were Erlocker and uh, Hester. Can you give us two stories about them? Man, I, t- I tell you, with, with uh, Erlocker, uh just was a good dude, man, all the way around. Uh, we would always – develop little games in the locker room and uh, as well known and as uh, uh, whatever, you know, the, the, everybody always, he was always hyped up in, in the media and, you know, everybody knew who Brian Erlacher was, but when we would create like a stick ball game in the locker room, he's participated. Uh, I used to make this huge tape ball and we would create this uh, competition. He jumps in the competition, shooting the ball. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And uh, and these, these these things could get get kind of like up there. But he still be, you know, it was just like I said, man. We had a wonderful locker room. And uh, with Hester, man, uh, you talking about a God fearing young man that that loved kids, and you know, again, a, a young player that came in that we had a great relationship. Uh, like I said, his wife was young, he was young, and those our groups would always get together and, and we would always do things together. So, like I said, wonderful times like that. And um, those are those are the things that that I, I committed myself to because I had that when, when I first got in as a rookie. Guys, guys were in there. They were older guys. We had an older locker room. Uh, Philip Daniels, I can remember Philip Daniels as, as a rookie, he inviting me uh, and some other guys that came in with my class, like Alex Brown, Bobby uh, Gray, uh, Brian Knight, invited us all over to his house, his wife, Cook. Uh, he got his kids there, man, and, and we just paid it for it every year. And when, when a guy leave, you know, somebody else would always fill that role and can't even leave out Olin Cruz, man. Um, you know, everybody remember Olin for just his yep. his his physical toughness on the field. But man, you're talking about a friend, um, always. You know what I'm saying? And just again, man, open his open his doors, open his uh, shared his family with with us as, as well um, as a young player. But again, he expected you to work hard in that weight room on the football field. And I'm going, I'm going in there as a 22 year old rookie. And, I, and but you got to humble yourself like you're a little child because <laughs> these guys have been there. And so you can't go in there as Mancho, man. I, like I said, I was a consensus All American going in there. But I still had to humble myself and, and, and act the part until it was my time, you know. And so when it was my time, I can just see the guys kind of like accepting who I was, you know what I'm saying? And, and that's what I appreciated about from transitioning from a rookie to a sophomore, and then you're a vet going into that second year. Yeah. What was what was it like, like? Or what was on your mind when you saw Hester catch that ball, and you knew he, there's a good chance he was running that thing back? That was that that was my first year of fantasy football. Was that year that Hester started was known for the punt returners, and he also played wide receiver as well. Yeah. So he was kind. Of, you could dress him in your fantasy league as a wide receiver, but get the points for the punt returns. Oh, yeah, of course. So then I got all these punt return points, and that was basically the first year that I really started playing fantasy football and watching it and learning about it. And now, of course, twenty years later. Oh, when, when when I saw him when they when they kicked because the whole thing was uh, going into the game, they're going to kick the ball away from you. Yeah. And uh, we was like, ain't no way they're going to kick him the ball. And all of a sudden, the magic happened. And you notice after that, they kicked it away from him every time. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. He, he never got that chance again, you know. And so uh, that was the, but we thought from the jump that he would never get an opportunity to return a ball at all. And when they kicked that ball to him, we, I mean, everybody <laughs> on the sideline knew that was to the house. Yeah. No doubt about it. <laughs> 
Uh, yeah. What was it like? Uh, what was it like sharing the field with uh, Greg Olson and now uh, your son DK sharing the field with him? I tell you what, I got a chance to uh, go out and hang out with them both uh, when Greg this summer before the seasons this past season going into the uh, into training camp. Greg came up into Seattle early, and I got a chance to go out and uh, meet well see Greg's wife again. But I got to meet his kids because I hadn't seen him uh since 2009 when the bears released me so you're talking about 2009 to and 2000 and uh the summer of 2020 and so it changes. That was, yeah that was a huge, <laughs> so he came in he had three kids his mom is uh and his dad was out there so i got a chance to uh say hello to them again but then to see him uh teaching the Kalen and giving the Kalen that, that knowledge and that wisdom and that understanding that he has gathered over the years. Cause you got to remember when I left, uh, Greg was just a rookie. And yeah. so now Greg is a pro bowler. He's the man, you know? And so now he's gone through some things where he can tell the Kalen as a young athlete, as a young pro, even though things were went great for the, for the Kalen, there are, other, there, there are others that can teach you. And so I love the fact that DeKalen opened, it, opened his heart and allowed uh, Greg to, to teach and to uh, show him some different things and different ways he can approach uh, just his explosion off the ball and his finish after catching the ball. Just so many different things that they worked on out there uh, for about a week before they reported to uh, training camp. So, Mike, I'm going to shoot the uh... – yeah story at the top they yep. so okay yesterday the day when we booked you this is pretty funny we were the day that we booked you for the show i'm all pumped i come home from work and i throw on this jersey here and i take the dog out for a walk i get literally a block down the road of very shits all over me all, <laughs> all, 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 all over me it shits all over the Metcalf jersey. It's like down my neck. Yeah. I'm, like, I'm like, oh, this is horrible. Whatever. This is this is horrible. But they say that's good luck. I quickly ran out and uh, grabbed the lotto ticket. And now something good's going to come, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, so we hope so. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's my bird shit story. <laughs> right? Uh. Okay. Yeah, uh, what's the what's the best advice a coach ever gave you? Listen, <laughs> work hard, trust God, uh, give your teammates glory regardless of what you've accomplished on the football field, and every man is equal. Don't treat anybody like they less than anybody, you know, and people will remember you if you do those things. And, mm -hmm. you know, because a lot of guys, uh, no matter what I've ever done, I can't talk like it wasn't four other guys beside me. I'm an old lineman. Even in high school, when I was a defensive tackle, there was three other guys at the line. So somebody had to flush the guy my way so that I could make the tackle, you know. And so um, I just – I've always my, – my coach has always said there's no I in team, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, so, so always be dialed into the team. Always be aware of uh, – how you represent yourself, and man, that is what that's those are the number one things I tell kids today, you know. Um, and you know, a lot of people talk about <laughs> falling back on education. Yes, that all that is true and dandy, but some guys come out of the NFL early and they go and they make millions of dollars. And if they want to, yes, go back and get your education. If there are some things that you want to venture off into, but. In order for you to even be able to get to the NFL, you better get your education. Because high school, and you look at how the NFL draft goes, they put a lot of emphasis on guys with those 3.5, those 3.0s, those 4.0 GPAs. And rightly so, man, because kids need to start focusing on that more. And my, my coaches was, was key with that, man. They were, you know, always talk good about your teammate, regardless of what's going on. Trust God, work your butt off, and treat no man lesser than you want somebody to treat you. And those are the things um, that I that I carry that I'll carry to the grave. Do you have any? Those are good. Those are good attributes to carry. Yeah. Yes, definitely they are. Do you have any hobbies outside of sports? You know what? I, I I'm a I'm a doodler, so I like to draw. 
Okay. Uh, yeah. That's basically all, man. I like to draw, man. I like to read. Um, those are like, my main two two things. And training kids, that's I, I find joy in that. You know. And yeah, yeah. you're you're coaching now. Uh, how's that going for you? Well, prior to this past year, I, I was coaching, but then oh. I moved out here to Vegas. And uh, with DeKalen playing with the Seahawks, I want to make myself available to go as he need me. And so I kind of got out of coaching. Okay. And, and that's what I said. Like, so for me now, I uh, I train kids. So uh, we, we we go to the to the park, and I, I've bought like a thousand cones, and I set up drills on the field. And I got scheduled uh, training sessions with different kids, and okay. I take them through Southern style training. Out here on the West Coast is a little different, yeah. uh, and you know because it's so hot. A lot of people don't like being outside in the heat. I've always said, as a young player, man, the sun is my friend, so I won't allow it to mentally get into my head. And uh, you know, I like to teach that to kids. And when parents talk to me about training morning time, evening, or noon time, I'm, I'm, I'm always going to opt for that evening, uh, that noon time, that evening time. So, <laughs> Do you have a favorite road stadium or city and why? My favorite two stadiums, because it's two. I love the uh, – now, it make it seem like I, I'm just saying this because the Kalen is playing there now. Oh, CenturyLink for sure. But the Seahawks Stadium, yeah. Oh my man, listen. When you walk out there as a player, you can't hear a thing. Oh yeah. So you have to rely on your instincts. I love the fans because the fans are straight diehard Seahawks. They don't. They're not shifty. You know what I'm <laughs> saying? They're very optimistic about the season. They love their guys. You know what I'm saying, and that that's what that's all I've always heard. Even as a player, when I was with the Bears, uh, uh, Floyd Womack, one of my guys from Mississippi, he played at Mississippi State, and he played. He also played guard and tackle for the Seahawks when I was in Chicago. Yeah. And uh, we're, we're we're both from the Mississippi Delta, so we're both from the exact same. And we live 30 minutes apart from each other. And um, man, that was something he always said. Man, if you can get to Seattle. If you can get to Seattle, man, you're gonna love the uh, the city because I love the stadium. Now the stadium is extremely loud and and just crazy. And then the next one, uh, I know the Minnesota Vikings have moved into their new stadium, but that old stadium, man, that was a spectacle. Now you're talking about relying on just your instincts again and the fans and just how they're dialed into that team. The Minnesota Vikings stadium, uh, I love Soldier Field. Now don't get me wrong, Soldier Field. And that's that's my heart. But you're talking about traveling off and going to other stadiums, those two by far because of sound. And I'm a sound guy when it, when, <laughs> it, when it comes to football. You need that noise. You need that crowd. You know, that's what, well, that's why I was so impressed with these guys this past year. Yeah. They play football without anybody being in the stadium. Man, that, do y'all know how hard that is? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's hard. That's difficult because – Regardless of what anybody think, the fans are needed. Momentum. Yeah, man. No, I would, and, and just because you, that, it's that, it's that adrenaline that you feel. You get that from your fans. You get that from away fans. But you, 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 you also ahead. feel you also feel that being in CenturyLink, screaming my top of my lungs, looking yeah. at the person beside me screaming at the top of their lungs. Yeah. And if you're then if you're not screaming at the top of your lungs, then you're getting frowned upon. So get exactly. screaming. Yeah, get <laughs> get screaming. I, I right. want to hear you scream. To participate, man. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. right. <laughs> and it's so loud in there. There's uh, I haven't had to do it, but I can see other people around you, you got your earbuds in or your some kind of ear protection because it's loud in there. It is. Yeah, yeah I love so. it, though. I oh, love so it. do I. Yeah, man. <laughs> and, and, and it it kind of drowns it. Yeah, and they got the best garlic fries in the whole in the whole state inside CenturyLink. See, now as, now as a parent, I get to experience that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Man, you know, that's the first jersey that I've ever worn is the Kalen jersey. So I'm like, ain't no way I'm not going to wear this jersey. Because I wasn't never a fan of wearing jerseys, but I'm like, 
got to get this jersey. Got to wear this jersey to a football game. Yeah. Had to get out of my comfort zone and all that. Got had to get the garlic fries. I had to become <laughs> a total fan. Can't be a a former player sitting in the stand. You got to be a dad and a complete fan. Yeah, so right. I participate fully. <laughs> I love it. I love it. There's oh, yeah. some good tailgate parties out there too. It is. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> uh, when did you uh, when did you figure out that uh, DK had something special? Like, can you share the moment with us that you kind of knew he was going to go somewhere? Well, as as far as like special, we we used to train when he was younger, and I trained him like because I knew no other way. Uh, I trained him based on the things that I did preparing for the NFL, and then the things that I did while I was in college. And so we would go on the field and we would do W drill, which you set the cones up in the W form. We would do four cone drills. We would do uh, the heavy, the high bags. We, we would do so much stuff in one day. Um, but he never would complain. Uh, no, I would say he never complained. The one day he tried to uh, act as if he was having this asthma attack so that he can get <laughs> out of the running. And I'm like, no, nah, you good. You, you, you'll get over that. <laughs> And so we finished the run, and then at that time, sixth grade, I could beat him running. Then the next year, when he hit the seventh grade, it was his. De- he was determined to never to lose to me again <laughs> on the football field. And and me, I tried. I was still in the NFL. I was still training, but everything that I tried to do to defeat him on the field. He was pushing himself the the more. You know what I'm saying? And we hit the stadium at Ole Miss. I'm talking about these stadiums are high, high. And he this kid can go up and finish from one side to the next. And man, I was just I just told him, man, the way you the way you carry yourself, um, the way you treat people, I said something special about you. And I'm not talking about your athletic ability, but just how you carry yourself. And uh, you know, I always would assure him that you're a kid and you're gonna make mistakes, but Man, like I told you, my three key things, the way you work, the way you treat people, and you develop your relationship with God. We can't make you develop that relationship. But as that, as you get older and that cultivates itself, you understand why I say treat people right and work hard, because that's what I felt like the word of God was teaching me, you know. And, uh, man, he took he took that and he ran with it. And as it he got better and better and better. Uh, and not just the Kalen, but his teammates with him that was training with us. Those guys got better and better and better. And they were able to accomplish a lot, man. They went to – they lost three straight state titles. So there yeah. was some deficiencies in certain areas. But offensively, man, they could score with the best of them. Uh, and so it, it was amazing, man. But I, I knew then, seventh grade, that there was something to him. You know. Yeah, and I, I read an article on you, and uh, it was saying that DK picked up somebody and they like, slammed him onto the track. Oh yeah, yeah. Now, he was playing against my hometown at the time, and uh, you know the movie uh, Blind Side with Michael yeah. Orr drive the guy down the field and throw him over the wall. Yeah, well, I look, like that. I'm coaching the D line, and uh, we're on offense at the time. And I look, and DeKalen is driving the DB, who is a who is the son of one of my former teammates in high school, and he just dumps this kid on the on the track. And I'm like, because I always told him, nobody wants a wide receiver that just wants to catch the football. You have to learn how to block. And we would always do blocking drills, hand fix, get your hands inside. When you get your hands inside, lock up and drive. And man, to see him do that. He started to uh, <laughs> count his pancake blocks like he was an old lineman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. And uh, we're obviously me and Ryan are massive fans of DK, and we have been since uh, his NCAA days. Um, we were both screaming at our TV draft day, um, okay. like take him, take him. What are you guys doing? Why is he <laughs> slipping? What's going on? Yeah. And uh, finally, Ryan got his way. I didn't. I'm a Bengals fan at heart. So Ryan got his way, and he ended up with DK, and he's never been happier. Yeah, yeah. Man. I I was literally screaming at my TV. I mean, they kept trading down and trading down. And I'm screaming. I'm like, take DK, take DK. <laughs> and then finally, third round after they Seahawks had moved back a couple times, 
And there it was me, and I was jumping up and down and screaming. Yeah. And I hope to find the footage of this. They still have the footage of me jumping up and down. So I'm gonna try <laughs> to throw that in here somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> into, the, into the clip. Uh, what, did what, what did you think? What What did you think of him? What did you think of him slipping? Well, I, like I told him this, you know, as far as the NFL go, it's all about getting in the NFL. And like I told you my story. Everybody had me believing I was going to be a first-round draft pick. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I ended up going in the third round. Um, and, and, and I just told him, it doesn't matter, like, what happens to you through the draft is what you do when you get in as a rookie. And to me, I know for him, he wanted to be that that guy, but it, it still happened for him. It still he still was given going went to a great organization with a great quarterback, with not just a great quarterback, but with the O line group, tight ends, running backs, a D line, linebackers. I can go on and on and on. A coaching staff, a city behind you. Uh, a, a, a whole region behind you. You know what I'm saying? And so I felt like it was the perfect place. And, you know, for him, every kid wants to be number one. That's all they know. And so all I could tell him was get in there. You know, even if, for guys this past draft, I know some players that wanted to be drafted, but you got a free agent opportunity. Go out there and show them through training camp that you deserve to be a part of that football team. And once you do that, man, sky's the limits for you. Because if they don't like you, another team is going to like you. You know, yeah, you definitely. put your resume together in, in, in every every turn. Everywhere you go, you're putting your resume together. And if one team don't like it, you should just make one like you. And then you'll be okay. And so that I never, I never got caught up in a place. Would I be happy for him had he been the first wide receiver or the number one player taken? Of course, but I'd have felt the exact same. You're the number one player taken. If you go into the NFL and you shit on it, you done. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. True. Rip you apart. True. But if you're if you're the number, if you're the last guy taken, Mr. Irrelevant, and he go into the NFL and he light it up, they'll remember him forever. Yeah. You know, yep. This is the last. Why would they allow this guy? They're gonna start questioning uh, the 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 um, the scouts. Why did he drop so low and has such an amazing uh, rookie rookie uh, year? You know what I'm yeah, saying? That's so, a great second year too. Yeah, it's it's always about just the opportunity, getting out there and doing your thing, making sure you're representing mm -hmm. that team the correct way, the city the the the, the correct way. You know, I and, know. And that's it. Yeah. And I know we needed a huge wide receiver. I mean, Lockett is awesome, but he's like speed and the little guy. Yeah. But they – or the littler guy. He's still bigger than me. I'm only like 5'5". Five, five, so <laughs> everybody's – I play big man ball, though, man. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. definitely. He's definitely amazing. does, yeah. for sure. Um, yeah, yeah I, I think getting DK there, uh, that's got to be the biggest steal in draft history, getting them with eight wide receivers ahead of them. Like, yeah. Yeah, I, I thought it – you know – what was crazy, man, most of those guys were working out together at Exos in Arizona, you know, so they knew each other, you know, and uh, all DeKalen can do is be happy for his guys because he yeah, had developed a relationship with, with most of them. Uh, and I met most of them down at Exos. And so you're talking about a, a core group of guys in that draft. Um, I think it was only two guys that were drafted ahead of DeKalen that wasn't in Arizona. Which oh, was wow. amazing the amount of talent that was already down there, and uh, you know, for me, man, I, like I said, I'm 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 never about like, oh, you should have this should have happened for you. No, you get an opportunity to shine. That's all I yep. care about, you know. And and one thing that I love about DeKalen, he know he couldn't come to me and say, you know, well, why did this happen? You know, because he knew what I was gonna say. You know what I'm saying? You got your opportunity. You're in there because because there's only a 253. I'm, I'm sorry, 254 guys that's going to get drafted out of about 1,800 yep, <laughs> every yeah. year. And if you're in that number, then you're better than the percentage, the majority. And so, as a minority in that group, go go ball out. You know, 
And then that's what I love about his mindset, man. Especially till it's even today, man. He just he wanna work hard and he wanna do well, you know. Um not just for himself, man, but for 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 the people that love him and you know the ones that care about him. Where were you when DK chased down Buddha Baker? Oh, I was there. Yeah, you were. Oh yeah. You know what? I did not go to that game. That's the one game we didn't go to. Uh you remember because they wasn't allowed, they were gonna allow fans, and then they decided they wasn't gonna allow fans. Oh yeah. So yeah, I wasn't I, I wasn't able to go to the game, but uh we were sitting at his house. Uh, in Seattle watching the game. And okay. so, you know, one thing somebody asked me, when did I know he was going to uh, catch him? Literally, I was just like, when I saw him running, I knew he was going to catch him. You know what I'm saying? He wasn't running like he wasn't trying to catch him. Yeah. He was running like he was going to catch him, you know? <laughs> because you could see everybody else like, oh, he's past me, so I'm going to slow down. You know what I'm yeah. saying? And not not knocking anybody, but you know what I'm saying. I'm big as I am. If I was out there, I would probably stop stop as well. You know, Buddha is not a slow guy. No. That's a fast guy, man. That's a heck of a uh, athlete, a heck of a uh, football player, man. And uh, that was a feat. Like and Decatur yeah. know it. He know that was a feat to catch Buddha. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Buddha's not a slow guy at all. That that <laughs> you know? highlight's gonna live on forever. And it's got to be one of the best highlights, definitely in Seahawk history, I would think. Yeah. And it's a lot better than the one that always bothers me, the one highlight where we should have ran the ball instead of throwing the ball <laughs> with Lynch. But, yeah. <laughs> hey. Um, but Coach, key, Carroll, Coach, Coach Carroll, I love Coach Carroll, so I, it's not, not a problem anymore. That kid that caught that interception, man, is from Coldwater, Mississippi, man. I'm sorry, Butler. Calhoun City, Mississippi, man. Butler. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know what I'm saying. So, well, but I just – I think that play, like man, it. meant so much, though, the one where – to run down Buddha like that. And that's why you can use it for so many different things. And that's, that's why it was special to me because just the sheer determination – not to give in and give up on it, even though when it seemed like, man, go ahead on and stop running. This dude finna score. You know what I'm saying? And DeKayla never, ever gave up on himself. Uh, and I know it was for the team. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't for DeKayla because if you remember in that game, DeKayla had – he was – he had only had four tar targets. He caught two balls, yeah. you know what I'm saying, out of the four. And – you know, didn't get any touchdowns. And so, you know, statistically, you know, that's not a game where you're going to talk about a wide receiver that's been been on point for you all season. But then, like I told him, man, regardless of what happened for you in that game, look what you did. You're the most talked about dude off of, based on that play. You know what I'm saying? We don't need – we forget that the defense goes out and stop them from scoring. Still, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there was a lot of good that went on through that process. The defense is to be commended because they got stopped on what yard line? Like yeah, the three. <laughs> on like the three yard line. And so for them to do that, man, that was impressive in itself, you know. I, I love it. <laughs> yeah, it was. These uh the, these Metcalf bloodlines are pretty good. Uh, can you give us a little intake on uh, So TJ? TJ is my uh, first cousin's uh, son, but we all grew up together, man. So he called me uncle all the time. And, uh, man, he's just a, a young young safety over in Birmingham, Alabama, right at 6'1", 181 pounds. Um, you know, I started a recruiting service called P5 Recruiting, based on my recruiting, based on the Kalen recruiting. And so it's to help families take control of their kids' recruiting uh, process and not rely on uh, their, their high school coach. And not to knock the high school coach, but that high school coach have at least, at minimum of the smallest team, probably 46 kids. And he has mm -hmm. so much to worry about, especially if he's teaching a class, if he's athletic director. And parents have to understand, you have to get involved. Like, I wish somebody had grabbed my mom and said, hey, re 
you need to write these uh, emails, send these emails to these colleges. You need to contact these college coaches. You need to get this video together and send it to these college coaches, you know what I'm saying, on behalf of your son. You know, and so that's what P5 recruiting is. It's a recruiting tool for families to to uh, take control, like I said, of their kids recruiting. And so that's what I do there for TJ. I'm helping my family understand this process. So I got guys that I know that's around the country that's coaching everywhere. And uh, on, on TJ's behalf, I just put his dad in contact with different, different people. And uh, Tennessee answered the call. You know, and and they gave him his offer, but he's a phenomenal. To me, he reminds me of Mike Brown that played with the Bears. Uh, he's a safety, but he's more of a that rover safety that plays around the box that'll hit yeah. you. You know, he'll get you the one interception, two interceptions here and there, but he's a he's a physical guy, and he's he's like I say, he's young. He's learning how to do it the right way, and 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 I pray that sky's the limits for him um, throughout this process. Can you tell us a little bit about this past weekend uh, with DK doing the track and field event? Uh huh. And you know, what? Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Well, well, one of the things when he when he did the Buda Baker thing, um, it was it was when when USA Track and Field tweeted out, "Hey, DK Metcalf, we got a spot for you. You know, if you're willing yeah. to come and compete." So from that moment forward, you know, Decayla don't like to be challenged. Well, I don't, I don't like to say he don't like to be challenged. <laughs> yeah. He's going to try to answer the challenge, you know, especially if there's time for him to do it in between football and it doesn't interfere. He's definitely going to go for that. And, uh, man, to be honest, he trained for about two months and a, and a week. <laughs> and yeah. so he had about, I'm going to say about, about eight solid weeks of training before he went out there and ran. And, you know, you hear all this stuff about what he could do, should do this and that. Uh, never, never was worried about that. You know what I'm saying? Because at the end of the day, you got to go out and perform, but being on that track with those guys, he has a, he had a phenomenal group around him. Um, Arthur Avant out of, uh, Coldwater, Mississippi, who has been his speed coach since he was, uh, seventh grade dropped everything and came to Arizona and started working with him. Um, Nick Hill over at Exos where DeKalen goes every summer to do his football training, get his body back. Right. Was right there with him the whole time because these two guys know DeKalen. They know what it's going to take to keep his body uh, physically fit. Uh, had him eating the right things the whole time and uh, had him focused on uh the task at hand. And so, you know, I, I, I really respected the time that he ran, man. I, you know, I didn't know what I, he was do. I, I had no idea what he was going to be able to run because in high school, he, he did do the 110 hurdles, the 300 hurdles, the uh, two by uh, four relay, the two by one relay, the triple jump. So he, he was a jack of all trades and track. But you yeah. never saw him just, you know, do the hundred or two hundred. But it wasn't. There was no doubt in my mind that he wasn't going to be uh, successful. And I and I felt like just based on the training and the videos that he was sending me, I knew it was going to be under a a, a ten five, a ten seven. So I knew he was under that. I just, I just, you know, I didn't know how close to a ten point one he would be, you know. And so, with, with, but it, I, I feel like it turned out extremely well because I, at the end of the day, I said, "Give me those." Oh, there <laughs> you I go. like it. Nice, yeah. nice. <laughs> do, do you have a favorite piece of sports memorabilia that you've ever collected? I collect so much uh, sports memorabilia. Okay. Even while I was playing, man, I got Devin Hester. I got three of his jerseys. Uh, Brian Erlacher, I got. I had three of his. But Mr. Jenner is here. You know, I give yeah. give things away. Uh, Earl Olin Krutz, uh Alex Brown, Bobby Gray, Brian Knight, just guys that were teammates of mine. Uh, also, Michael Jordan. Um, wow. You know, uh, Kobe, uh, um, LeBron, high school jersey. I got a lot of stuff. I you know, I'm, I'm I'm really really big in that because I felt like when I was younger I wasn't into it, and 
you know, just to have these different things. And I collect everything of Decatur, everything. So do I. If they make something, I got it, you know. <laughs> yeah, hey, um, I got it, too. I'm, I'm yeah, trying to get it. I'm telling you, like, I got his uh, touchdown balls. I got the jersey from the Minnesota Vikings uh, win where he scored that winning touchdown. The jersey from the Dallas Cowboys game where he scored that touchdown. The jersey from the Philadelphia Eagles game when he had 177 yards re- receiving. And and I'm just – I'd be wanting this stuff just because, you know, a lot when people are young, they really don't understand, like, just how important this may be for, like, my grandkids and my great-grandkids, you know. And to have it for them, that's why I feel like, you know, you know, that's why I love collecting this stuff. And that's actually really smart of you, Terrence, because uh, we interview a lot of, like, Hall of Famers and that kind of people, like, in hockey, let's just say, for instance. And they always say to us that we wish we would have, but we didn't. Like yeah. they didn't keep anything. And nowadays they're like, oh, I wish I would have kept, you know, Gretzky stick when I played with them, but I didn't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy to me, man. And yeah. and I'm willing, and I'll ask anybody, you know, I'll ask any of the guys, like, because I mean, why if I'm around them, I, I never feel like, you know, I'm above anybody. You know what I'm saying? I don't feel like now when they're with their families, I'll never be disrespectful to any player like that. But if we in the locker room, I'm around them. I'm like, hey, yo, can you autograph this for me? I just think that, you know, it's not for me to sell my stuff. It's for me to to have it, you know, to always be able to show the kids. You know what I'm saying? As you can see, we're all co- – Oh, we're man, I love collect- your collection, bro. Yeah. I'm yeah. looking at it like crazy. I'm like, you got a mad collection now. Yeah, we, yeah. we, we, we yeah. both <laughs> we both do a lot of collecting. And, yeah, man. Uh, yeah. Stuff like that. <laughs> Mike? Yeah, Um. Uh, him with the last one. Okay. Uh, On the side. Oh, what do you want the Metcalf family name to be remembered as? Well, man, one of, one of the main things is just you hear my you hear my passion for people. You hear my passion for teammates. You hear my passion for the Lord. And so I just I just always feel like you treat people how you want to be treated, you know. Yeah. Um, you respect people how you want to be respected. And, you know, I, you can't ask for any more. Uh, I am who I am now. You know, I'm not going to try to pretend like I'm just a pushover because I'm a gladiator. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I was raised from seventh grade to I was 32 years old on the gridiron. You know what I'm saying? But I, but I was also taught to care for people off the gridiron. So I was mm-hmm. taught how to act and how to represent myself and, you know, and, and to be uh, considerate of others. And so um, if I can say how you you remember me, man, just, just a humble individual that was a dog on the field and a gentle giant off the field. And the same for DeKalen because he's a big dude. Yeah. Uh, but I know he cares <laughs> for people. Um, but he just grimy when he's on the gridiron, man. He's gonna go after you, and he and right and back and back to the man to do the same, huh? And back to the track thing. I mean, DK was so much bigger than all of them too. So yeah. that has to have that has to have a little bit of uh, time difference. I don't care. I don't care what it says, but a right. smaller guy is gonna run a lot faster than a big guy. Right, right, right. And and then then, then that's one thing that it was so. It's, it's good that he has it in his head that he understands that. Hey, your ten three. Uh, six or ten, three, seven, whatever it was, man. Compared to you, got a guy right beside you that ran a ten, three, six that was seventy pounds less than you. A guy <laughs> yeah. right ahead of you that was the exact same thing that ran a ten, two, eight. You wasn't that far off from the winner that ran a ten, one, yeah, something. Exactly. So I'm like, dude, it's 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 amazing, man. But again, God has to show us all in due time, you know. Uh. Just that enlightenment, man, because I, I felt like it was an amazing feat because I could hear the commentator now that I watched the television uh, part. He stated it like this. Don't get out of your game if they get too far ahead of you. So to me, <laughs> he was basically saying these guys are going to beat you out of the block right out of the gate. Just run your race how you run your race, regardless of what it looks like. Just finish. Yeah, in my and, mind, I'm like, I'm watching DeKalen send me his starts before he go and race. I'm like, he ain't getting beat out the block. 
<laughs> and he, he was he had it out of the block. He was right there out of the block. Oh, yeah. And yeah. it was like maybe the last ten meters that I, I felt right. that I got past. Right, 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 right. Right. You're also, you're also double the size of everybody. <laughs> That's and, right. And, and, you know, you know, he 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 would say no excuses. You know what I'm saying? He would yeah. say he lost, which is true. You know what I'm saying? He, he didn't come in. He didn't come in first like he wanted to. But uh, at the end of the day, man, I, I told him, man, that was a wonderful thing you did. You put on for absolutely, me, man. Yeah. If, if nobody else, if you the first to do it, and I don't know if he was the first to do it. I know he's been the first to do it in my time. Uh, yep. And so, hey, you did it. Now, maybe somebody else will be inspired to go do it too. You know, that's and right. I know that's not what the NFL want. No, uh, I was going to, I forgot to ask that part. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. If the Seahawks were worried, you know, what, what happens if he got hurt? Right, exactly. Well, you know, that's that's always in the back of somebody's mind. Uh, knock, even, on, and, knock on wood, that doesn't happen. Right, 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 right. But at any time, and guys are away from the facilities. If I'm even when I'm coaching, when I was coaching in junior college, I'm like, we have no control over these guys when they're away from us. Uh, what are they doing? Uh, what is their focus like? And man, we can't control it. And so you hope and pray that they understand that they're a vital part of what we got going on and the success that we can have coming into the season. So we, you hope and pray that they never put themselves in a position where they'll jeopardize their future, you know. And I know that's that's always on Pete's mind. That's always on Russell's mind. That's always on DeKalen's mind. All the guys, Tyler, all those guys that's heavily involved in, you know, the outcome of this season, you know, from their O-line, from their left tackle to the right tackle, man, I pray they come in here healthy. So, because yes. I feel like we got the pieces to do something yep. special, you know. And, and that's and all across the league, man. <laughs> Uh, Terrence, when did uh, when did DK really like become the specimen he is? Like, when did he get the big growth spurt? Because I mean, Ryan's still waiting for his. Yeah, I've been waiting, I've been, I've been waiting since elementary school for that. <laughs> I'll say, I'll say, his freshman year, man, he kind of left home uh, after high school because he was always a big dude in high school, a uh, big strong kid in high school. But then that freshman year. You can really see like a shift in his body, man. It just, he got taller. He was he got bigger, stronger. He got there's a video that's circulating uh, where he power clean like 355 pounds, yeah. um, and so <laughs> it's ridiculous, man. So I, he's, we've always he's always been strong though, man. You know, it's just uh, I, I really feel like that freshman year he kind of his body kind of kind of changed. You know, uh, I'm gonna okay. keep. I'm gonna keep holding out for my growth spurt, though. Even though I'm at thir <laughs> 38 now, I'm heading the opposite direction. I'm getting short. Well, I say this, me <laughs> and you, because I thought I was gonna be six eight, so I'll be holding off for four more inches too. <laughs> yeah, I'm going the wrong way though. I'm, gonna, I'm starting to crouch over and get an old walking stick. <laughs> Right. Hey, uh, Ter Terrence, yeah, I just want to thank you very, very much uh, for taking the time for us today. We're big fans of you. We're big fans of DK and the Metcalf family. And uh, it really did mean a lot to us today. Man, thank you guys for having me. I, I swear, I, I appreciate you guys for uh, just having me on and uh, look forward to uh, seeing you guys up in Vancouver, man. And absolutely, I, really, I appreciate uh, that a lot. And I'm uh, I'm hoping to end up down there, maybe buy a beer down there at the Seahawks game sometime. Let's go, man. Let's go. For Let's sure, for sure. We'll, we'll connect off, off the air, yeah. uh, make sure we got each other's numbers, yeah. and uh, we'll go from there. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. Right. If you're looking for a mug, perhaps a hoodie, head on over to IonlyTouchGreatness.com. Looking for the most beers on tap? Great stakes. Great staff, head over to the John B. Pub. We got the best beers, steaks, chicken wings, nachos in town. Come see us at the John B. Pub. The John B. Pub, the best bar in town. Come sign up for our football pool. Say hey, sent you.